scientific expression. coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to tonight's South Asian edition of Apex Express. I'm your host and producer of tonight's show, Anuj Vaidya, filling in for Preeti Mangala Shekhar. Two months ago, on July 11th, we took you to an urban forest in the middle of the megacity of Bombay the R.A. Forest, which has been on the front lines of a battle between the state and indigenous and environmental activists since 2014. In that episode, we travel to the future and imagine the city in 2042 from the point of view of the R.A. Forest. In this companion documentary to the earlier speculative piece, we return to the R.A. Forest and this time we travel into the past and zoom in on 2019, when the hashtag SaveRA movement reached a flashpoint. We bring the story up to date to the present. जंगल वाच वाया तू धावर जंगल वाच वाया तू धावर अपली झाड़े वाच वाया The cutting of trees has devastated our way of life. It has displaced the birds. It has destroyed our forest farms. It has severed our connection to one another and to the animal world with the leopards, the birds, the plants. When the trees disappear, the relations disappear. I wanted to make that clear. गेली आमची शेती हरवली नाती गोती हे नात वाचवाया तू धावर आमची शेती वाचवाया तू धावर वाग देवा जंगल वाचवाया तू धावर कळली ही नाही जाना या निसर्गाची महती हिरवा देव म्हणती ज्याला हे आदिवासी you people do not understand the significance of the natural world. In any case, what you consider merely nature, we consider divine. It is our God, Hirva. As tribals, we might be illiterate, but we understand the fundamental truth. While you educated folks are unable to grasp its importance, whatever life we have, it can never be without the forest. We exist because the forest exists. That's what this song conveys. Kalli hi nahi jana ya nisarga chi mahati Hirwa deva manti jala hai adivasi Hirwa hi vatsavaya tu dhavar Hirwa hi vatsavaya tu dhavar Hirwa deva jangal vatsavaya tu dhavar Last ka gaya dekho mera kaisa hai आम्ही श्वास घेतो आहे कृपा तुझी ही मोठी तुझा मुळेच आहे जीवित आज सृष्टी हम लोग सांस रे ले रहे हैं ए दैट वी ब्रीथ इज थैंक्स टू योर ग्रेस एंड विदाउट द ब्रेथ वी आर एज गुड एज डेड आम्ही श्वास घेतो आहे कृपा तुझी ही मोठी तुझा मुळेच आहे जीवित आज सृष्टी हे जीवन वाचवाया तू धावर हिरव्या देवा जंगल वाचवाया तू धावर जंगल वाचवाया तू धावर आपली झाड वाचवाया तू धावर वाग देवा जंगल वाचवाया तू धावर 
I don't have faith in others. It is up to you and me to save the forest. People seem to think that the forest is alive because of us. It's actually the other way around. We are alive thanks to the forest. We are first and foremost children of the earth. I feel a responsibility towards the fires blazing in Brazil. I feel that way towards any natural disaster that happens in the world. If we can all have that depth of feeling, then perhaps we have a chance. Otherwise, we will only have destruction. In July 2019, I arrived in India seeking to learn more about forests and contemporary movements to protect them. Prakash Bhoyer, whose voice you just heard, was one of the people I met along the way. Prakash is an artist, a singer, an activist, a forest farmer, a Bombay Municipal Corporation employee, a leader in Bombay's Vanli community, and a leader in the hashtag Save Our A movement, a citizen-led initiative to save one of the last remaining old-growth forests with megafauna within city limits. The Varlis, originally hunters, who eventually became forest farmers, live and farm in the forests all the way up the coast from Bombay to the neighboring state of Gujarat. Varli art, the form of ritual visual art that they practice, is renowned across the country and even the world, especially in France and Japan. But until six years ago, most of the city of Bombay had no idea that a thriving Varli community existed right within the megalopolis. Sanjeev Valsan, a Bombay-based photographer and environmental activist, explains. I didn't know, uh, honestly speaking, that there were so many tribals in the city where I was born. Uh, I knew that there was a Sanjay the Gandhi National Park and I knew about Yur and I knew there was a place called Are and I knew it was green because every time we would pass through that place in, you know, a bus or something, we would notice the temperature going down by at least five degrees and uh, it was quite obvious there was something magical about the place but, you know, when then you just pass through the place and then, then that was just like some sort of uh, thought and a memory. So you wouldn't think that this place is uh, home to uh, seven to ten thousand uh, indigenous tribals, uh, the Adivasis of India. Um, they are the, the Warlis, the Konfnas, uh, the um, uh, some Katkaris, uh, also uh, the uh, Malarkulis. Uh, so uh, there, there are about four or five tribes uh, living in Sanjeev's surprise at finding thriving indigenous communities or Adivasis as they are called in India in the heart of Mumbai is a story I heard over and over again during my time there. In fact, the forest leopards were more famous than the human communities that they shared the forest with. While news of morning joggers being ambushed by leopards were periodically reported in the previous decades, recently these encounters had become more frequent due to increasing spheres of interaction between humans and leopards, especially at the edge of the forest, the zones of contact. On the one hand, you had the poor and migrant workers who did not have a place in the already overcrowded city moving into the forest and setting up shanty towns along the edges. And on the other hand, you had apartment complexes popping up all along the edge of the forest thanks to rapid urbanization. And one, the Royal Palms, was a housing colony and luxury hotel that had arisen smack dab in the middle of the forest. Predictably, it was the poor who were targeted as encroachers in the forest, and in the process, all those who lived in the forest, including the Adivasis, were seen as illegal trespassers. India's constitution provides a lot of protection to indigenous communities, including a landmark act, the Forest Rights Act, that was passed in 2006, which recognizes the prior rights of forest dwellers. Under this act, the forest communities just have to come together in the form of a village council or a panchayat and declare their communal rights to the land in order to be recognized. Since these are not rights given to the tribals by the state, rather a recognition of rights prior to the state, the court of law is only invoked in case someone challenges these prior rights. Unfortunately for the Vardlis of Bombay, they have only gotten around to invoking this act recently, in the aftermath of the onslaught on their traditional lands. 
while the Ministry of Tribal Affairs is supposed to facilitate this work and provide instructions and workshops to tribal communities that want to declare their prior rights, in reality this work has languished in the hands of the government. And it has been up to NGOs to undertake this work. In the meantime, in the forests of Bombay, the government is actively trying to prove that the tribals who live there are not tribals at all. Especially in Prajapurpada, which borders the proposed site for Bombay's new metro shed. Asha Poi, a resident of this hamlet, explains. I prove that I am a Adivasi because I have the documents. I can prove that I am a tribal. I have the needed documents. And first of all, you need to understand that where there are forests, there are tribals. These forests exist because we have been stewarding them for all these years. We are not encroachers. The officials felt we were lying, so they reached out to the Ministry of Tribal Affairs, which is where we get our caste certificates. They also confirmed the fact that we are tribals. So it took them a whole year to believe us, even though we had the paperwork. Now they finally believe us. My husband's family has been living here for generations. My father-in-law is 81, and we are three generations living here now. Him, my husband, and me, and our children. So what is this noise? That's the noise of the metro being built. So we've just filed a court case for the forest farms that we lost to the construction site. And we've asked for restitution to be given land, equal amount of land elsewhere in the forest so that we can continue farming. So have folks from here been moved to the Slum Rehabilitation Authority's buildings? Yes, a lot of Adivasis have been moved out of here. See, these government officials are fast talkers. First, they promised us land elsewhere. Now they claim that we never had any land in the first place and that this piece of land never had any trees to begin with. Many folks have proof. They have photos from before. But the government has gone back to claiming that this land was an illegal slum. They just lie through their teeth. See, there is this woman named Lakshmi Gekwad. The metro conducted a survey of her land before construction began and said she had 600 to 700 trees and now the officials claim that she had none. In fact, their current claim is that there was a slum there and a little road, which is a complete lie. This woman used to grow rice and vegetables there 12 months of the year, and she would take it to the market to sell them. She did not want to leave this place at all. She was ready with gasoline, ready to set herself on fire in protest. But the police and the bouncers forcibly removed her from her own home. And she was threatened with criminal charges if she was seen here again. So five of us have taken out a court case and she is one of the petitioners. Asha Poi's case is just one of several court cases with the RA forest at its center. So before we go further, let us stop for a second and review the history of this patch of forest called Are, which has suddenly become such a contested area in Bombay, for its history as the dream project of a welfare state is a far cry from the position it now occupies in the crosshairs of a predatory state. In the 1950s, the forest department handed over 1300 hectares of forest land to the dairy department to conduct a grand socialist experiment. Over the next decade, under the leadership of Dara Nusirwanji Kurodi, the RA milk colony revolutionized milk production and supply in India. Kurodi moved dairy farmers from across the Bombay area to the forest, where they would be provided with sheds for their buffaloes, living quarters for their families, and schools for their children. This would allow for a centralized milk distribution scheme and reduce the health risks related to urban dairy production. The Vardlis and other tribes who were already living in these forests at that time were given symbolic leases to the land for one rupee per guntha, which amounts to one fortieth of an acre. 
They continued to live and farm in the forest, and some of them even started working in the dairies. The city continued to develop the forest as a tourist attraction, dubbing the main lake in the area Chota Kashmir, or Little Kashmir. My mom and my uncles, who grew up in Bombay, remember RA as an idyllic forest getaway on the outskirts of the city. Almost 70 years down the road, this patch of forest is now at the center of this rapidly choking metropolis. On my first trip into the forest to meet Prakash and his family, Sanjeev asked me to meet him at a restaurant on JVLR, the Juhu Vikroli Link Road, which links Bombay's eastern corridor to its western corridor. Only a recent addition to the city's growing transport infrastructure, it is already one of the most clogged arteries of the city. I was incredulous that we would find a forest so close to the hustle and bustle of the city, a park perhaps, but not a forest. Sanjeev led me to an unassuming gate next to the Oberoi International School, which was one of the entryways in. We walked down a set of stairs overlooking a marsh, and following the winding path through a series of slums, somewhere the path took a turn into the dense green foliage, and when we emerged on the other side, it was a sight to behold. A series of mud homes with thatched roofs, painted in Vardli motifs. There was hardly a sound in the world, except the singing of birds, and the sound of the breeze in the trees. If you looked up towards the sky, you could see the silhouette of the apartment complexes, and the school hovering overhead. I would learn from Prakash that these had been a hillock in his childhood. He remembered crossing over that hillock to go swim in a lake on the other side and to fish with his father. His wife, Pramila Thai, who originally hails from Dahanu, which is about three hours up the coast, describes the changes she has seen in the forest since she arrived 30 years ago. <laughs> All you saw was endless green. I was so happy when I first moved here after marriage. It was such a beautiful place. In the city, there is pollution. From all the traffic, there is noise, chow chow, meow meow, all day, all night. In the forest, it is so peaceful. It is so calm that you can hear the sound of a leaf dropping. This place was really amazing before. Nowadays, there's a lot of traffic around here because they recently opened the roads that cut through the forest. These roads were shut down during the night earlier. I refuse to leave the forest. I don't want to move to the city. How can we leave this land and these plants? We've regarded them as our own children. How can we leave them behind? Now we have no interest in being rehabilitated. Have the tribals ever asked for anything of you people? Why should we? We have everything we need in the forest. It's you people who always come to us, sneaking into our lands, and now all of Ari is under attack. Not one inch of it is safe. We have been fighting all our lives, and we won't let anyone destroy this forest, no matter who we have to face. We have a strong coalition, and all the women have started to prepare themselves. The next time anyone encroaches on the forest, we will fight back. That conversation with Pramila Tai took place at the end of August 2019. A little over a month later, on October 4th, the Bombay High Court rejected a plea by the NGO Vanashakti to declare RA a forest. That very night, the MMRC, the Mumbai Metro Rail Corporation, started cutting trees by cover of dark. For the environmental activists and tribal leaders, that was the last straw. Pramila Thai, along with hundreds of other activists, 
stormed the metro car shed that night, putting into action the battle cry that she had raised during her earlier conversation with me. The police was immediately deployed. Over 100 activists were detained, and eventually 29 of them were arrested and held on trumped-up charges of obstructing and assaulting the police. Pramila Tai was one of these 29, and she wears her time in jail as a badge of honor now. Over the next few months, the Ari Forest went into a lockdown. What was once a destination for nature enthusiasts had now become a forbidden zone. A British-era law, Section 144, was imposed on the forest, preventing people from gathering in large groups. The tribal hamlets were surrounded by police, effectively incarcerating the tribals in their own homes and preventing any communication or mobility in the forest. The activists also escalated their tactics, engaging in civil disobedience and hunger strikes. An appeal had been filed against the Bombay High Court's ruling in the Supreme Court, but by the time the Supreme Court handed down a stay order on the tree cutting, the MMRC had chopped down over 2,000 trees already. As Stalin Dayanand, the ED of Vanashakti, explains in the following interview segment, this was the modus operandi of the government, to delay and deflect, to challenge the legal definition of simple and straightforward terms, and to change the laws and legal definitions when it suited them. In fact, three uh, litigations which are currently filed by Vanashakti and which are being heard, one of them uh, pertains to the case of the documents uh, missing from the government records. These documents uh, would prove that uh, RA was part of the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. And uh, mysteriously, these documents have gone missing from all the government files. So if it was part of a protected area, then there is no way the government could have come in with different destructive projects, and nor could anyone cut down any trees in that. So this case is listed tomorrow for hearing and we are uh, hopeful of getting a hearing uh, in, in this matter. So at, uh, at the heart of this um, issue is the fact whether RA is a forest in the first place or not. So that is another right? case which is going on again in the High Court. It's another case where we have sought the declaration of RA as a forest as per the directions given by the Honorable Supreme Court in the Godavarman versus Union of India matter uh, where the court had directed that any area which has reasonable good tree cover or resembles a forest must be immediately notified and protected. So it was uh, somehow mysteriously, it was uh, not mysteriously, uh, deliberately it was not done. And RA was left for the people to, who wanted to destroy it. So it was left open. So we're trying to get that corrected. RA fulfills all definitions of a forest by virtue of having about five lakh trees in this 1,200 hectares. Uh, there are about three lakes in RA. There are so many grasslands in RA. There are meadows in RA. Um, so uh, I would say all in all, uh, it's a beautiful area which needs to be protected. And what is the, um, I guess, the government's um, reason for trying to not to get it declassified as a forest? Mumbai's uh, industry or the biggest industry in Mumbai today is the construction industry. The real estate industry calls the shots. Wherever lands are uh, seen, or they are seen as land banks which can be just perforated and taken away for construction. So that is one of the main reasons why Mumbai is rapidly losing its green spaces and RA happens to be the single largest green space remaining for uh, the citizens of Mumbai. It's the lungs of Mumbai literally. So, um, can you give us a little history? Because I know this issue has been going on since the 60s or something, na? where it, like at some point, Ari was considered part of... Um, Till, uh, nine, uh, see, in 1969, the docu uh, documents which we unearthed uh, say that in 1969, the entire Ari colony was handed over to the National Park. And subsequently, the documents have gone missing. But we found another document in the year 1983, where the divisional manager of the Forest Development Corporation, which was controlling the National Park at that time, had said that we have received so much land from RA, it needs to be notified as a forest so that we can protect it. 
and the government uh, at that point of time said it's not necessary we will uh, it is okay you can protect it using the existing laws and that was the end of it subsequently like i told you all the documents went missing and no attempt was ever made by anyone and for everyone who's grown up in mumbai in the last uh, 30 40 years ra was always a forest and considered to be part of the national park in many ways people knew it as a forest of mumbai only thing there were some agricultural uh, activities going on there were some educational institutions in sarare so that was only difference but then even the national park had uh, different institutions inside it also so that wouldn't be a case that uh, because of these institutions the area doesn't qualify when mm-hmm. we have filed a case against the location of the metro car shed in area because it is a red category industry which will destroy 3000 trees and it is against the law to allow a red category highly polluting industry on the banks of the mithi mithi river no river can allow be a, no industry can be permitted to come up so close to the river so having said that this uh, metro car shed is it's not a car shed it's a service center which will use all kinds of chemicals oil grease paints electronic waste electrical waste acids batteries name it everything will be done there so we are strictly opposed to this because there are options to it not just in uh, ra is not the place for a car service center or railway service center certainly no but in the year 2006 uh the then governor of maharashtra his excellency uh, mohammad faisal he sent a letter to the state government saying that ra is not being used for the purpose it was being given uh, since it is being dis- degraded it please rejoin it to the national park and protect it as a biological reserve and sadly uh, 12 13 years or uh, 14 years later nobody has bothered to act on that letter so there was an intent at a particular point a particular point of time to try and protect ra but uh, the government to appease the developers decided and managed in fact to strategically excise ra from the national park by bringing in townships on its borders which cut it off from the national park as tal notes the fragmentation of the forest had been planned for a long time beginning with the creation of film city in 1977 but more importantly it was the key to a host of development projects in the pipeline next to the metro would be the slum rehabilitation authority housing complex where slum dwellers across the city would be relocated also in the works was a metro bhavan an office building cum commercial space and the icing on the cake was a proposal for a zoo or a biodiversity park it is here that the carceral logic of the state comes through most clearly The fragmentation of forests has already created a difficult situation for megafauna like leopards whose territorial range is quite large. As long as RA is contiguous with the protected Sanjay Gandhi National Park, which is close to 20,000 acres of forest, the leopards have a wildlife corridor to move back and forth. However, if RA becomes isolated from the SGMP, then the leopards become trapped. raising the specter and suspicion of the proposed zoo project is that where the leopards will end up the lack of wildlife corridors is not only an issue in ra but is an issue across india especially as the country ramps up its transport infrastructure through road and high speed rail construction the movement of capital is being prioritized over the movement of migratory species and as more and more of the country's forests are fragmenting and becoming prisons for wildlife these animals are being forced into confrontations with humans rather than help solve the problem the central government's recent proposals for environmental impact assessments required for new infrastructure projects only seems forced to exacerbate it The new amendments show a blatant disregard for any environmental regulations, effectively giving any and all energy and infrastructure projects the green light. This means that rail and road projects need not go through an environmental review process at all. But in a recent conversation with Sanjeev, he asked if the EIA had ever been the stalwart legislation it is made out to be. Well, um obviously the, the new um, amendments to the eia rules uh, uh, proposed uh, this year uh, are going to make them a little worse than what they used to be but uh, let's face it um, uh, you see a lot of hashtags saying save the eia rules and save you know save the old law but the old law itself is crap uh, and we need a new one uh, for example with ra 
Now, the, o- the old law itself that everybody is fighting to save exempts railway pro- projects from having to prepare uh, an EIA to, to even conduct uh, a proper environmental uh, impact assessment report. So uh, the Metro 3 in Mumbai actually did an EIA. They did conduct an EIA f- to get a foreign loan from uh, JICA, which is uh, the Japanese uh, uh, government uh, lend- overseas lending arm. Uh, because they required an EIA, but the EIA was completely false. It just had lies and you know false data, and it it even excluded the RA railway station, uh, you know, uh, a railway station in the forest in the metro, and it it didn't it didn't figure, um, and it was so obviously false. But Indian law allows it to be false because it says in any case you don't need an EIA for railway projects. That's also why they're building a, a bullet train, uh, you know, in, in between Mumbai and uh, uh, Gujarat. And uh, that's chopping down, again, like tons of mangroves and trees and stepping on uh, Adivasi, you know, the tribal villages and stealing away their homeland and things like that. And it's a huge loan that I- India is taking, you know, from Japan, again, Again, from the same uh, overseas lending agency, JICA. And so there's this deal between Abe Shinzo and Narendra Modi. Uh, but, you know, that aside, the, uh, the old EIA uh, didn't manage to do its job either because we have less than 15% forest cover in India. And if the old, old EIA uh, uh, was this big effective law, we wouldn't be in the situation. The whole point is that the old EIA needs to be scrapped and we need a new one. It's, it's not about saving an old... A recent article in the Times of India points out that the EIA is possibly the most amended piece of environmental law in India. With over 43 amendments and 350 pages of memorandums, diluting the effectiveness of the process. The article also raises issues about the conflict of interest inherent in the process, as it is the project proponent who is charged with producing this report. There are also questions about the efficacy of EIAs for individual projects, as that does not account for the cumulative systemic impacts of these projects. What is needed is a complete rehaul of the process, not simply a return to an ideal previous version, because that does not exist in reality. And even if we do end up with a more stringent piece of legislation, one of the biggest problems in India has been the implementation of the laws. Currently, the rates of approval for projects under the EIA are close to 100%. And even when there is non-compliance, there are hardly any consequences. While the National Green Tribunal was set up in 2010 to hear cases related to the environment and make recommendations to the courts, it has no power to enforce the law. Since 2014, however, the tribunal has been allowed to languish and neglect has become the strategy for engagement. In the case of the RA forest, the EIA narrative has changed numerous times. First, the question was, is RA a protected forest? Then the question became, is RA a forest at all? Today, the forest's future still hangs in the balance. All cases in the Bombay High Court and National Green Tribunal around RA have been dismissed and a few cases and appeals remain at the Supreme Court level. But Amrita Bhattacharya, one of the petitioners, wonders if going the legal route was the best strategy after all. My experience is saying that uh, uh, legal aspect is only one of the aspect but uh, what makes a bigger difference to the movement is people and uh, if a, a case uh, can't stand in the court it actually uh, does damages uh, but when people are standing together uh, that force can bring in a much more uh, desired change rather than some uh, you know legal process or other documentation process uh, that we in today's world we tend to know uh, do somewhere i think um, uh, we are losing that 
touch of people and things are becoming more mechanical wherein what we need is more involvement of people in it uh, and uh, uh, if we look around uh, even across uh, the, the uh, little outskirt of mumbai we see the movement in palghar which is about bullet train uh, destroying forest areas and taking away lands from the tribals there they did not file a case but on the ground tribals are standing strong and they are not even allowing service to happen i don't uh, i would not be able to clearly actually explain it but i was talking to people from other movements and that's the aspect they brought is that if some judgment is passed in favor of somebody else then that person's all actions become legal Yeah, and th- there somewhere we get binded by that judgment, and this is where uh, I think uh, cases are very tricky. Right. And I, as a, uh, a citizen who has become a part of this movement, uh, would say that it is more important that. in larger number people start taking part in this kind of movements and start voicing out their opinion people power does seem to be helping make the changes that the courts have failed the public on while the legal fate of the forest hangs in the balance still at the supreme court level things have shifted in terms of local governance the ra issue was one of the reasons for the surprise defeat of the bjp in the midterm regional elections which took place barely a month after the ra fracas began in early october 2019 the shiv sena explicitly ran and won on an environmental platform related to the ra forest which would never have been possible without the collective mobilization of the hashtag #saveare movement the first thing that the shiv sena led coalition did was to stay work on the metro and all other bjp initiated infrastructure projects such as the coastal highway and the bullet train a new eia was initiated at the end of last year to reassess the viability of the metro shed in the forest but the team charged with producing an environmental assessment came back with an economic assessment instead saying that relocation was economically unviable however Recent developments seem to be moving in a positive direction. Sanjeev Valsan elaborates. Kind of uh, protests that you had on the streets uh, pre-COVID, and uh, post-COVID is also post new government, which is um, at least uh, uh, vocally sympathetic to RA and uh, came into power and uh, you know replaced the old government because of what the old government did at RA and what the new government promised uh, you know it would repair. uh so um so protest itself has been slightly hesitant because the government has been sympathetic however uh, a lot of the work on the the car shed has continued and it's unknown why some of that work has continued but the government has announced that it's studying other uh, locations for um, this uh, car shed however we haven't seen the maps uh, of these uh, sites so we can't comment till we actually see those uh and um uh then there's another de- development which is that uh, the government has also uh i think for the first time since independence actually recognized ra as a forest and that to 600 acres of uh, ra and they call this phase 1 so they're going to reserve it as a reserve forest uh, and it might be merged with the you know the main north uh, national park uh, to the north the sanjay gandhi national park so um this is pretty significant a lot of people uh, um, are asking this question why only a part and i would say yeah part by part is also fine you know as long as they finally get to it so uh protest has been a bit um you know um in in a bit of a strange place but uh, it it hasn't uh, been absent so we've kept uh, our protest into a sort of affirmation which um uh, so we have started these tree planting uh, sessions in in ra uh, every week this monsoon we have been planting trees and we've been getting people to uh, to come and plant uh, replant the native species of uh, ra which have been lost over the years uh, through uh, environmental degradation through various government projects so um uh, you can call this a protest but it's also a kind of love building exercise because we you know we go there and smell the earth and touch the soil and 
meet the tribals and we work with the tribals and we meet the farmers, we buy organic vegetables from them. Uh, we are also going to start volunteering in the organic uh, farms of the tribals so that, you know, urban people can learn organic farming from them and they'd also get a few, you know, um, help us. Uh, While planting trees is definitely a beneficial activity, it cannot be a panacea for deforestation as it is usually touted for it takes time for a forest to grow. The deleterious effects of deforestation are immediate. The beneficial effects of tree planting, however, are deferred to the future. Sanjeev knows this very well, as he has been working on rewilding another patch of forest on the eastern outskirts of Bombay, in a cooperatively owned forest called Vanvadi that he chanced upon a few years ago. When the forest was jointly purchased by a group of friends over 20 years ago, it was done with the express intent of protecting the land from development. This 65-acre forest now has a thriving water table year-round in stark contrast to surrounding areas. And it is also providing local tribals and villagers with access to firewood and forest foods. Sanjeev and others have also been periodically hosting educational events that bring city residents to the forest to witness its bounty firsthand and to engage in forest farming, tree planting and foraging. When I visited Vanwadi last year on a torrential weekend in July, it was for one such forest foods foraging trip. However, Tree planting in the hands of the government has not always been so successful. Problems include planting saplings in the wrong season, planting non-natives, planting trees on grasslands, not removing the plastic around the root balls when planting saplings, and lack of ongoing care once the saplings are planted. On average, only 60% of trees in such tree planting drives make it to maturity. The recent mismanagement in Turkey is a prime example. 11 million trees were planted in November 2019 in a massive citizen action. But by January 2020, 90% of these trees were already dead. India has similarly undertaken numerous tree planting drives with the most recent one in July 2020, where 220 million trees were planted in one day in the state of Uttar Pradesh. Prakash Bhoyer has much to say about this. I have seen the government's 33 crore paid to the government. I just read that the government is planning on planting 3 million trees. Is this necessary? You don't need to plant a single tree. Just don't interfere with the forest that already exists. Do you think the forests of the world were planted by humans? They grew on their own. They don't need your help. The reason they are fragmenting is because of your interference. And all this talk of tree planting is just a performance. Us tribals, we plant trees every year. We sometimes cut trees to build homes off of firewood, but only as much as we need. We don't cut trees for profit. Planting trees used to bring me a great amount of joy. I used to anticipate its growth. It will be this big in five years, this big in 10, this big in 20. But now I dread the day the tree will ask me the question, hey, you've planted a seed and brought me into this world. But can you guarantee my survival until the very end? Someone will come along with the project and I will be chopped down in my prime. Can you guarantee that won't happen? I don't have an adequate response to this question. But I must say there is a movement growing in the city of Bombay. It is not only the tribals who are coming together, but other urban citizens, including students from colleges and schools, are joining the cause. They are recognizing that the forest is an oxygen factory and that we must save Ari. So lately I feel more confident that I can give these trees my word and I will protect them to the end. oxygen factory promise While it seems likely that the Ari forest will at least partially be saved, that is not the case for the city's mangrove forests, which had seen a 70% decline as of 2018. 
as a city imposed upon an estuary and literally built by suturing together seven islands in the Arabian Sea, Bombay is prone to soaking, especially during the monsoons. A hard line between land and water is impossible in this aqueous terrain, but this view of the city is at odds with the direction of its urban growth, which has systematically dismantled its ability to regulate ebbs and flows. In the age of escalating sea levels and climate chaos, the loss of mangroves has turned the soaking into flooding in recent decades. A lack of systems thinking is on display in the city's metro project as well, which was touted as a smart solution to Bombay's traffic and congestion problems. No one stopped to think that by the time the metro was built, future demand would far surpass the metro's current capacity. No one stopped to examine the research that said that metro systems do not reduce road congestion. In fact, there is an induced demand for more cars on the road in the aftermath of a new transport system. For commuters assume that many previous drivers have now switched to the new mode of transport. No one stopped to ask the question why so many people were migrating to urban areas in the first place and what could be done to alleviate the devastation of India's rural heartlands. No one seemed to realize that the city is not an isolated unit. It is part of a system of varying patterns of human inhabitation. In order to tend to Bombay, one also had to tend to the networks that fed into the city. That would be the smart solution. No one in government had stopped to ask the question, smart for whom and at whose expense? Well, no one, but the environmental activists, that is. That Mumbai Metro is uh, zero emissions because it's powered by electricity. Now, you need to think about this for, for five seconds. Which electricity is zero emissions? Okay, so now let's move forward from there. Uh, the, the grid that Mumbai Metro is uh, drawing from is uh, powered by coal uh, thermal powered plants in Maharashtra. Uh, any project that increases electricity used by a huge amount, uh, this is maybe close to between 600,000 to uh, a million metric tons of carbon, di carbon dioxide per year just from this one railway line. And, th and there are going to be 14 such lines. Um, now, uh, in terms of emissions, it's complete nonsense that uh, the metro, the coal-powered metro is going to uh, save uh, Mumbai from pollution. See, what's, what can save Mumbai from pollution is recognizing what is causing the pollution, which is private cars. And um, between 70 and 80 percent of uh, the road space in Mumbai is often occupied by private cars. And uh, these private cars are just used by the minority of people. The majority of uh, the rest are just stuffed into, uh, you know, uh, public uh, transport, which is moving really slow because of the private cars. So if you really want to solve the transport problem in Mumbai, you have to uh, you have to speed up the bus at the expense of the car. See, the car has to be made slower than the bus, which doesn't mean just you randomly slow down the car. You need to give the bus a dedicated lane, at least, at least during rush hour. All the flyovers, all the freeways, all the fastest routes should go to the bus. And the cars get the slower routes and maybe fewer routes. And as a consequence, the, the cars get stuck in traffic jams. So a car owner has a choice. Um, do I want to be late for my appointment or do I want to be in my car and be comfortable? I think uh, Mumbai being a hardworking business city, everybody knows the time is money. And they will happily leave their cars at home if the bus is faster. And not only this, once this is done, the, the bus will be faster than the car was before it. So uh, BRTS, uh, Bus Rapid Transport System, dedicated bus lanes, this is the key to Mumbai. And a lot of transport experts have been saying this over the years, but politicians don't like it because it's too cheap, you know, and they don't get to commission big contracts. While the state government, under the watchful eyes of activists, moves glacially to save 600 acres in the middle of the sprawling megalopolis of Bombay, the central government is speed-rolling 40 coal mines in the densely forested areas of Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand in central India. It does not seem likely that India will reach its goal to increase its forest cover to 235 million hectares by 2030. Perhaps if we take Prakash's provocation seriously, 
we will aur mujhe aisa bhi lag raha hai ki ye itni badi bombay and i also feel that a big city like bombay must cultivate forests all i've seen is the forest being raised down to build a city it's never been like wow the city was here 10 years ago and now it's been turned into a forest such ideas need to be encouraged during my last week in india in december 2019 i stood in my mother's seventh floor balcony in the city of pune watching grey hornbills kingfishers monkeys and snakes traverse the housing society compound on one side of the building was the bustling bombay bangalore highway and on the other side was the tekdi the ridge that runs in a ring all around the city with the dense green canopy at its feet it struck me then that we have always already been in the forest while being in the city as urbanites we are unable to recognize the forest in the city because for us the forest is always elsewhere away from the city the forest is where the wild things are it is where the other lives it's not a place for human habitation but the distance between forest and city is not as far as we imagine for instance the are forest is often referred to as a degraded or disturbed forest it is a forest that is becoming city right in front of our eyes what i was seeing from my mother's balcony was a forest that was a little further ahead in that journey it had already become a city there is a lesson to be learned here especially as we mourn the large swaths of forest across the world that are disappearing before our eyes whether due to development or drought or forest fires it seems that forests are present in our lives largely through their absence right now so how do we cope with this absence how do we learn to live with it perhaps if we think of absence as latency that gives us an opening the destruction of the forest does not mean that it has disappeared forever we have simply turned it into a fugitive forest a deferred forest a forest waiting to return for it knows that it eventually will given that it operates on time cycles unfathomable to humans i know this does not reduce the scale or horror and the suffering that deforestation causes but i want to take prakash's proposition seriously for this is as much a time to act as it is to grieve and as he reminds us we must do both and not either or in this moment of crisis we must both cultivate forests where we can and also resist their destruction for the varlis of ari forest there is no difference between community and ecology they are both containers for the essential relations that sustain us one of the biggest lessons i learned from them was that the forest is more than just its trees rather it is the richness of relations it holds that makes it a forest perhaps another way of thinking about cities then is as impoverished forests for the relations we hold are certainly not as rich as the ones that the varlis cultivate so how can we turn our cities into the forests that are already latent in the landscape how do we cultivate our ability to sense the latent forest in the city film scholar vivian sobchak argues that our bodily ability to sense the world is our sense ability sensibility our ability to respond to what we sense is our response ability or ethics our future forests are already here they are hiding in plain sight can we see them can we hear them can we feel them can we smell them and the bigger question is once we have sensed the latent forest can we respond how will we respond and that brings an end to tonight's show i've been your host and producer anuj vaidya special thanks to rucha chitness and preeti mangla shekar for providing the translated voices and special thanks also to the citizens and the varlis of bombay for their generosity and their vision do send any thoughts or feedback that this show sparked for you to apex at kpfa.org that's a p e x at kpfa.org 
Tune back in next week for another edition of Apex Express. I leave you now with an excerpt from a song by Swadeshi, a crew of Bombay-based MCs, DJs, graffiti artists, and producers, featuring Prakash Bhoi. This is the Vardli Revolt. Stay safe, everybody. exist because racial discrimination doesn't exist only way to create that is for anti-racists to be in power but but not only for anti-racists to be in power we need anti-racist policies to be the law of the land but we don't just need anti-racist policies to be the law of the land we need anti-racist ideas of racial equality to be the common sense of the people And we don't just need anti-racist ideas to be the common sense of the people. We need that anti-racist common sense of the people to hold those leaders and those policies accountable. Advancing the conversation to abolish racism for over 70 years. 94.1.
KPFA. In the next 70, 70, years, 70, 70 years, years, the people will rise up and the gun lobby will collapse. No nonsense gun legislation will take hold and school shootings, suicide, domestic violence, and murder rates will evaporate. More common sense and less need for thoughts and prayers. In the next 70 years, your fiercely independent radio station will be here to cover it for you. For you. For you. 94.1 FM, KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Hi, 